to start with some uh, announcements. So we want to welcome everybody again uh, to church this morning at Grace Life Bible Church. We want to especially welcome those of you that are joining us on the live stream. And before I get too far into this, I need to remember that I need to share uh, the live stream. So what we're doing here, in case you were, uh, in case you were wondering, is we are streaming live to uh, Facebook and YouTube at the same time. And then what I'm doing is I'm sharing, I have, my, I have my tablet open right here, and I'm also sharing it to the church's page. So anybody who might be friends with the church, but not necessarily um, a friend of mine, not because I'm not friends with them, but because we're just not, we don't know each other on Facebook, um, they can also get that there. So the idea is to put the message in as many places as possible. So right now we should be able to be located in three spots. The church's YouTube page, my personal Facebook page, and then the church's, um, also the church's um, uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook page, okay? So if you would, look at the uh, a slide above me. I just have some announcements here that I want to get started with. Before I get forget, though, I have a handwritten one that I didn't know about until this morning, okay? So Braden and Marissa have welcomed their son, uh, their son, James Robert Marks, so Todd is officially a grandpa. So everybody make sure that you send greetings uh, to uh, the Smith Marks family. Todd and Chandra are grandma and grandpa now. James Robert Marks was born on Friday, and he was 8 pounds, 10 ounces. Uh, that's the only information that I have for you at this time on that, but we want to congratulate them and uh, the Marks and Smith family there for uh, the birth of their son and grandson. So we want to congratulate them for that. Um, moving on, the Transform Life, Living the Transform Life group is delayed currently until August, okay? Now this delay came out because of the governor's order uh, of Friday as far as mask wearing and there are some folks in our assembly, just so you guys are aware, there are some folks in our assembly that have very strict protocols at their jobs where they have to sign off on sort of where they've been and this kind of a thing. And uh, this applies to some of the people in our church, and they wanted some more time to kind of think through how all this stuff might affect them, all right? Um, while we're on that topic, we, I, and, and we will be resuming it, I'm just not sure when. I wanted to, to mention something, I wanted to read some official language to you here about the issue of masks and how masks impact churches. So I'm reading this language right off of the executive order. It says, no individual is subject to penalty under the order for removing a mask while engaging in religious worship at a house of religious worship. Although consistent with guidance from the CDC, congregates are strongly encouraged to wear face coverings during religious services. So in my mind, that's completely consistent with what we were already doing. Um, no one, you're under no legal obligation to continue to wear a mask while we are having church, but it seems consistent with what we uh, established earlier as far as a request of wearing one in the building before and after, but again, that is not a requirement, okay? So I just want to make sure that we're all clear on that. In my mind, nothing has changed as far as the assembly is concerned from what we've already been doing uh, the last four times that we met. So please be aware of that. Saturday, this coming Saturday, July 18th, there's a graduation open house for Sean's daughter, Rosemary Talsma, from 1.30 to 3.30 at the Fellowship Center next to the Central Avenue Christian Reform Church in Holland, okay? So I see that Sean is out there. Sean, you're here. I see you. If you have any questions about the details on that, I would uh, encourage you to see Sean. But there's an open house for Sean's daughter who graduated recently. And again, that's Saturday from 1.30 to 3.30, all right? Also, we have the board meeting and men's breakfast. We are going to move forward with that. Uh, we're having a men's breakfast at 7.30 at the uh, New Beginnings restaurant for anybody who wants to attend. And then we will be having our board meeting at 9 o'clock. Those who are comfortable meeting in person, we will, have, we will be meeting here at the church, and then we have the option to uh, have anyone else join through Zoom who might want to, uh, to do that, okay? So be aware of that coming up. Also, again, I, just prayers for uh, Joan Blaine and uh, Lori Zimmer. Uh, we visited with them yesterday, and um, that, that was a good visit, and we're, we're glad to, um, 
to, to report good things about that. Um, and then obviously the work that Blake and Amy are doing on the teens' uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook pages. Can you bring me the next one, Mark? I want to give an update. Daryl produced, Daryl Dornboss, the treasurer, produced an update. Um, some of you, I don't know if you saw this or not, but um, for 2020, for the year to date, income versus actual offerings received, our goal through 26 weeks, so this is as of the last day of June, correct? Um, our, our weekly goal was uh, 36400 and our actual uh, offerings from all sources, this would include folks here in the assembly, PayPal, folks who have sent gifts, et cetera, through the mail or PayPal, our actual uh, offerings have been 34693 So we are running a little bit behind what the goal is so far through the first half of the year. So um, please don't forget to uh, remember the church in your financial planning. I know things are nuts right now but we are trying to continue to move forward uh, with the ministry. And then as always, your offering options, since we're not collecting an offering, you have the box back there. You could uh, access PayPal or you could use the snail mail. So you have multiple different options. And then again, just a reminder that we have one anothering funds that have been donated to help folks uh, if they are uh, experiencing a financial hardship because of the coronavirus. If that's you, you need to let myself or Daryl know and we'd be happy to discuss how the church might be able to help you during, uh, the, the, during that time. So without any further delay, uh, can you bring up the next one, Mark? We're going to get into the message. <clears throat> and the message, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Come with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, I've titled the, uh, this morning's message, The Present Distress and the Bottom Line. The Present Distress and the Bottom Line. So as you may know, the last two Sundays I've departed from our study of Colossians, uh, to address some matters related to the present distress, the current situation, the climate that we have in our culture that we're facing as a local church, different things that are happening right now in the United States, where we are at as a country in the, in the, uh, the, the, the cycles of history, if you will. And I want to kind of bring some closure to that this morning by talking about what the bottom line of all of this is for you and I as believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I want to read this and then we'll uh, have a word of prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and look at verse 26. Paul says here, I suppose therefore that it is good for the present distress, I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife, seek not to be loosed. Art thou loose from a wife, seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We just pray that as we uh, get into the message this morning, that we will uh, have open hearts and minds that are receptive and attentive to your word. Lord, that we would be able to make your word the main issue, the main focus of our lives, that, that we would seek to not just be hearers of the word, not just be people that know intellectually what the word says, but that we would be people who are endeavoring to live the word, to have conduct as becometh a saint to walk out in the details of our lives the, 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 the realities, the doctrines, the truths that we know to be true from your word. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for everything that is going on right now. We, we, we know that you, you instruct us in your word that we should pray for those in authority that we might live a quiet and peaceable life with all godliness and honesty. So we pray for our leaders, our local leaders, our state leaders, our, our national, federal leaders. We pray for uh, for our country. We pray for our local church and our assembly here. We pray for those who are with us this morning and those of us who aren't and those of us who might be joining uh, who have no contact with our assembly except through our online ministries and we're grateful for them and we pray that we would allow the word to have free course that we'd be edified, built up, and strengthened in the faith this morning as we look at the bottom line of all of this as it relates to us as members of the body of Christ. We're grateful for the time we could spend together in your word. In Christ's name, amen. So we've been talking, I've been using this verse here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 26, where Paul talks about the present distress. And, he's, and I've said it the first two times and I'll say it again. When Paul brings this up here, he's writing to the Corinthians in the first century on the eve of the great uh, persecutions and, uh, and so forth that would break forth upon the believing church under the Roman emperors, Nero, Caligula, and others. 
and he's giving them some instruction here in light of this, right? And I've tried to make it clear, and hopefully I have, that there's a reason why, there's a real historical, contextual, first century reason why Paul gives this advice here about divorce and remarriage, etc., to people in light of the present distress. But I've also tried to extrapolate that out and, and say to you, are we, are we, have we always seen, when I say we, I mean the body of Christ, the believing church, has there ever been a day where we, not have, where we have not experienced the stress of some kind, right? And we can go down through church history, we did that in the Grace History Project, and we looked at these groups, we looked at these folks throughout history who have, you know, been persecuted, etc., um, and, and had to really take a stand for their faith. And so we, we want to understand the present distress that we are currently looking at. And so two weeks ago, we looked at the issue of the present distress in the local church. Come over with me to Acts, Acts uh, 26. Come over to Acts 26. And we looked at Paul and his experiences after he was arrested in the temple at Jerusalem, and everything that Paul went through as far as uh, false imprisonment, beating, we saw that he was uh, held by corrupt Roman officials for more than two years that were waiting for bribes to let him go. We, we, and we, we went through this whole scenario here as we traced it through to Acts 26. And then the first time Paul stands up in Acts 26, he says there in verse 2, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day because, uh, before thee, touching all things, where am I accused of the Jews? And we looked at that, that, that mindset that Paul had of being able to be happy despite everything that had occurred to him, right? And we talked about how that happiness that Paul had was not coming from looking at his circumstances. It wasn't coming from looking at how he'd been treated and how he'd been mishandled and unjustly accused, etc. But he's able to be happy in the midst of the circumstance because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Drop down to verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, so speaking there directly to Agrippa, but not only, uh, not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. So Paul is, does he like the fact that he's in bonds? No. Would he rather have his freedom? Would he rather be set free? Of course he would. But his, his mindset and his happiness is not directly tied to the situation and the circumstances that he finds himself in. Secondly, in that study from two weeks ago, again titled uh, The Present Distress in the Local Church, come over to Romans 12, we discuss issues related to masks and grace and one anothering and being able to um, forbear with one another and understanding that there's a diversity of opinions that people have, etc. about some of these things and that we should not allow these things to divide the assembly and to cause there to be a problem within the local church. And we looked at some verses here. Look at Romans 12. Look at verse 10. He says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. And so we looked at how... We, we, I tried to show you how some of these one anotherings might apply to some of the issues that we are currently facing. Go over to Romans 14. Go over to Romans 14. Verse 13. In this context in Romans, Paul's speaking about you know issues of personal preference, issues of you know the weaker brother versus the stronger brother, and the eating of herbs, and he gives a bunch of different examples here in this passage, and he, he, he comes down through this, and he says in verse 13, he says, let us, therefore, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. And Paul, in this, in this passage, he's not talking about you know, issues related to the gospel, the, the, the basic contents, contents of justification, how a man is saved. He's talking about these issues that we encounter where some people might think one way and some another way. Look at verse um, 7. No, verse... Um, do, 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 where is it? No, I want verse... 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another. And so I talked to you about some of those issues that we were facing there related to the local church and the wearing of masks. And we also looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You don't need to turn there where Paul says we should have the same care for one for another. Galatians 4, by love serve one another. 
We looked at Galatians 5, that we should not be biting and devouring and consuming one another. And then we looked at the idea of forbearing one another in love in Ephesians chapter 4. And then last week, <clears throat> I got the whiteboard out and I went through a bunch of stuff about the present distress and the fourth turning. Okay? By the way, that message from last Sunday, um, I have the, the data on it, that message has been viewed over 1,300 times. Uh, combined between both YouTube and Facebook. That message that I preached last Sunday, and I've heard from people in Norway, I've heard from people in South Africa, I've heard from people all around the country writing me, thanking me for that message, and the way that I tried to explain what was going on from, from sort of a cyclical pattern, by looking at the patterns of history and trying to understand you know, what may or may not be going on in our present uh, situation. Okay, But Last week we looked at the present distress and the fourth turning and I did a couple things. The first thing I did is I reviewed with you the biblical model for understanding history that I presented back in 2016 and 2015, right? We're dispensational in this church, so you have the line. God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, right? And then we looked at the issue that as we, as we traverse from the beginning to the end, there are cycles that are occurring in history, right? And those cycles are being driven forward or pulled forward by the prophesy end that God has uh, set forth in His Word, right? What sets God apart, God Almighty apart from the other gods that, that are around us that the Gentiles worship? Our God knows the beginning from what? The end, right? Has our God, was He there and did He create in the beginning? And as he told us through prophetic utterances in his word, what will happen in the future. Okay, and so we understand that, right? And while we're advancing towards that prophesied end, there are cycles that are occurring. And then thirdly, I talked to you about the slope of this line being sloped downward, and that this tire is rolling down the hill, and I tried to explain and lay out for you a paradigm for understanding history from a biblical point of view. And then lastly, we discussed where America is during this current winter season. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Come with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and look with me at verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And so we looked at the nation of Israel last Sunday, and we saw, and we looked at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, where God says, to everything there is a season, right? And we went through and read that passage there where he talks about a time for this and a time for that, right? A time to sow and a time to reap, etc. And we went through that and we talked about that, right? Paul identifies some things here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing, here's what we're to do. What are we to do? Verse 2, preach what? The Word. What are we supposed to be preaching? Man's opinion? Human viewpoint? No, we're to preach what? The Word. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and what? Out of season. Is Paul identifying there that there are going to be times that the message, that the preaching of the Gospel is going to appear to be more fruitful or more seasonable than other times, right? And there are going to be times where men are, are, are more open and they are more, more willing to receive the Gospel. They're more willing to receive the Word as it's preached. And then there are going to be times and seasons where men are going to be closed off to it, where they're not going to be open to it for, for various reasons, right? And so we understand that, we, that we, are, we are in a season right now which the Gospel and the preaching of the Word is probably out of season, right? Out there in the culture at least, right? Not for us that believe it's not. It's never out of season. But out there in the culture, out there in, 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 in where we are living and where we are trying to minister, we're encountering, encountering people who are hostile to the Word of God, who don't like what God says, who are not open to really hearing about the, these things. And so we understand that there are seasons of fruit and seasons where it seems like nothing is happening. But remember, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that we plant and we water, but who gives the what? Who gives the increase? The Lord does. God does. God is the one who gives the increase, right? So our job 
in the middle of the crisis situation is to continue to preach the Word, whether it's in season or out of season, and to allow God to give what? The increase. Okay? And then also I ended, go to Colossians chapter 3. You know what? Don't go there because we'll be coming back there. We looked at the idea of setting our affection on things where? Above, not on things on the earth. So all that was my introduction. This morning what I want to do is I want to try to bring some closure to this little mini-series in talking about the present distress by talking about this morning the present distress and the bottom line. The present distress and the bottom line. To start this, if you would, come over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I'm working off of here what I just said about the Word being in season and out of season about preaching the Word regardless of the season, regardless of the situation that we're in. Okay, because Why do we do that? Why is it our job to just do what we're supposed to do? Because what happens, folks, is the church comes along, churchianity comes along, and they want to come up with some gimmick. They want to come up with some sort of new technique, some sort of new you know, pet idea that if you would just do it this way, then you know, everybody would listen and, and, and all that sort of thing. The reason I object to that is because the power of God unto salvation is in the Gospel of Christ. It's not in your technique. It's not in your approach. Now, you should have a good approach. That's why we taught about tactics, you know, having a, having a, having a way of, of, of handling yourself and talking to people in a way that doesn't shut them off to wanting to listen to you, right? But the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16, look at the verse. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of what? The Gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to who? The Greek. Folks, the power of God unto salvation to everyone. Everyone. Who's everyone? Everyone is everyone, right? Everyone is men, women, children. It doesn't matter whether you're Asian, whether you're Australian. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. The power of God unto salvation is in the Gospel of Christ. Okay, And God is willing to save and justify any man, woman, or child, regardless of who they are, through the, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to who? To the Greek. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look with me at verse 18. Look with me at verse 18. Notice, notice here, in Romans 1.16, Paul said he's not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Look what he says here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the what? The cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is what? Folks, what is it that we preach? What is it that the Gospel of Christ is about? It's about the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It's about the cross work of Christ. Notice what it says about that. It says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish what? What did Paul say? In, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he said, preach the word, be instant what? In season and out of season. The reality is, folks, is that when we preach... When we teach, when we talk about the power of God unto salvation being in the cross and the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, are there going to be people that hear that and say, this is foolish? Are there going to be people that hear that and say, this is dumb, this is stupid, and you're dumb, and you're stupid, and you're foolish for believing such a cockamamie thing? Now, you might have encountered people like that. I have. Right? But... Understand, they are not rejecting you. They are not rejecting me. What are they rejecting? They are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of God unto salvation that is being offered through, to, uh, to, uh, through what you are telling them in the preaching of the Gospel. Drop down to verse 23. Same chapter, verse 23. Notice what Paul says. He says, but we preach Christ how? Crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block. 
Why is it a stumbling block to the Jews? It's a stumbling block to the Jews because who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? Pilate was ready to let him go, right? But what did the Jewish nation say? They said, crucify him, crucify him, right? And so this is a stumbling block for the Jews. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews, a stumbling block. And under the Greeks, that's the Gentiles. Under them, it's what? Foolishness. They think this is stupid. What are you talking about? Don't you know that, that you have to do stuff to help God out? Don't you know that the religious mind of man thinks that he's okay? and that God will accept whatever He thinks He can bring to God of any value? But our Gospel, our message, the power of God and His salvation through the preaching of the cross is that God won't accept any of that stuff, and the only thing that He'll accept is the shed blood of His Son. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is what? Stronger than men. Only the preaching of the cross, folks, has the capacity to change someone's heart. Only the preaching of the cross has the ability to change someone's heart. Okay, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's not talking about a saved man's heart. That's talking about a lost man's heart. And only through the preaching of the cross can a, lost, can a, can a heart be changed. Can somebody's heart be transformed? Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> Come over to 2 Corinthians. I feel like I missed something there, but apparently I didn't. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to work our way down through some verses here. Look with me at verse 14. <laughs> it says here, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge. Now watch carefully. If one died for how many? All. Okay, how many did Christ die for? All. Paul says all. Not some, not many, not the ones you like. Okay, he died for what? All. Christ, for if one died for all, then we're all what? Dead. So Christ died for all. That is, again, as I said earlier, that's every man, woman, and child, regardless of fill in the blank. Okay? Regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of uh, their race, regardless of their color, regardless of their ancestry, regardless of anything, right? Christ died for all because all were what? Dead, right? And that includes all of humanity. Come with me over to Galatians. chapter. Hold your hand in, in 2 Corinthians. Mark it. Come with me over to Galatians chapter 2. Notice how Paul words this. Come over to Galatians chapter 2. Come over to Galatians chapter 2 and look with me at verse 2. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, I went up by revelation. Now watch. And communicated unto them that gospel which I preached not to the Gentiles, which I preached among who? the Gentiles, okay? But privately to them which are of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Paul preached among who? The Gentiles, right? Paul is preached. So when Paul looks at the Gentile world, and by the way, at this point, has Israel fallen from their, from their preferred standing of time past, right? So that's, what, that, that's one reason why the Jewish nation couldn't really stomach Paul's message, right? Because Paul was telling them that if they wanted to be saved, they had to come to God the same way what? Gentiles were coming to God, right? And that is solely by grace through faith through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says unto them, verse 2 here, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among who? Among the Gentiles. Paul's gospel is not focused on groups. Okay? 
Paul didn't do a de- Paul didn't do a demographic study and say, ah, well, this this particular town is you know 85 percent blue-eyed people and 35 percent or 25 percent brown-eyed people, and so you know I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna adopt a particular strategy so that I can reach the majority. No, that's not what he did. He went among who the Gentile. He went among whoever was there to what here regardless of who they were, regardless of their nation, regardless of their nationality or anything else, right? So Paul's Gospel is not focused on groups, but on individual people out of every nation, out of every different type of people group that's out there. And all of that, by the way, is a bunch of silly stuff because God hath of one blood made all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of what? The earth, right? And so Paul goes out with an every man, every nation, all people, all cultures, all groups, message and ministry among the Gentiles. The Gospel that we preach meet. listen, the Gospel that we preach meets the need of every human heart and fills up the individual's life with Christ and hopefully an understanding of their completeness in who? In Christ. So the bottom line, the, uh, the present distress and the bottom line, the bottom line is the same. The bottom line hasn't changed with coronavirus than it was before coronavirus. The bottom line is and always will be, as long as this dispensation is in effect, the bottom line will always be the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto what? Salvation. All souls matter to God. All souls matter to God. It doesn't, Paul does not distinguish, he does not delineate. In fact, he goes to great lengths and, and places to say that there's no difference. And so we should think that way. We should operate that way. We should emulate Paul and not see and and see two kinds of humanity. The two kinds of humanity that we should see are those who are in Adam and those who are where? In Christ. And as those who are in Christ, we should treat everybody with the love of Christ. Whether you agree with their lifestyle or not. Now, I'm not advocating for aberrant lifestyles, okay? That's, that, don't misunderstand me, right? But I know that there is a way, and I'm going to show it to you from the Scripture here, there's a way that we should act and feel and believe and function as believers, right? Because we want to bring as many people into eternity with us. That's our job. That's our function as members of the church, the body of Christ. Christ died for all. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. For if he died for all. By the way, when it says if there, it doesn't mean maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It means on the basis of the established fact that Christ what? It's an if of logic. It's an if of reason there, right? He says, and it, there isn't an if there. What am, you got? Yes, thank you, Ernie. I knew there was an if somewhere there, okay? Verse 10, and that he died for who? Thank you all. Now why did he do it? Now did he do it to save you from your sins? Did he he die for all? Did he die for all to save all that would believe from their sins? Yes or yes? Okay, yes. Okay, But that's not all. Look, Look at what the next verse says. Or the next part of that verse. And that he died for all that, the person in the intent, that they which live, that would be us. That would be those of us who are saved, right? That they which live should not henceforth live unto who? Themselves. But unto Him that died for them and what? You guys are with me, right? You're all awake, right? You can read English this morning, is that right? Okay. Just kidding. And that He died for all and that, that, and that all... and that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them. Now think about what that means. Who should I be living for? Should I be living for Brian Ross? No. 
Should, I, should my life be about indulging everything that I think, feel, and want to be involved in? Is that the goal of my life now as a believer? The goal of my life as a believer is that I henceforth not live unto myself, what the verse says, not unto myself, not unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them, and what? Rose again, right? So my life now as a believer should not be about me. My life should be about who? My life should be about Christ. Okay? Verse four, let's read verse 14 and 15 together now. For the... For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge. In other words, we we come to this judgment, we come to this reasoning, right? That if one died for all, then we're all what? Dead, we already covered that. And, in addition to that, and that He died for all, that they which live, that would be us who are believers, that they which live should not henceforth live unto who? themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again, that's Christ. So as a believer, my life should be about who? Christ. Christ's love should constrain me. Christ's love should motivate me. Christ's love should be the thing that keeps me going, to be the thing that motivates me to do the right thing, to treat my wife and my children and other people in the correct way and in the correct manner based upon who I've been made in Christ. Come hold your hand there and go over to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. In verse 19, Paul says. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not what? Ooh. Think about that. What does our culture say? Well, it's my body. I should be able to do what I want with my own body. Not if you're a believer, it's not your body. Who do you belong to? You belong to the Lord. Look at the next verse. For ye are bought with a what? A price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are who? God's. I'm going to say it a little bit irreverent way just to get you to think about it, but do you know that God thinks that you have a nice body? Do you know that? That makes me happy when I look at my body, okay? I'm just saying. But I'm serious, right? God has redeemed and purchased your body as a vessel of earth to be used for His glory. That's what He's saying here, right? So when He says over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when He says that we should not henceforth live unto ourselves, but unto Him that died and rose again, right? That's what He said. You put that with this verse, and your body's not your own anymore as a believer, and you are to honor God, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are who? Which are God's. Let me ask you a question. Has that changed? What's today? Today is July 12, 2020, right? Has that changed since before anybody knew what the coronavirus was? That hasn't changed one bit, one iota, one minuscule of an amount. It's the same. Come with me over to Philippians chapter 3. Come with me over to Philippians chapter 3. Folks, we got a lot of people that have a lot of head knowledge about the Bible. And I say say that in a general sense. I'm not just talking about... Is it wrong to know a lot of stuff about the Bible? Is that a good thing to know a lot of stuff about the Bible? Is it good to know about right division and dispensational truth and all that sort of thing? Yes, all that stuff is good, right? But do you also know that knowledge puffeth up? And if you're in it just for the knowledge, and if you're in it just to be able to correct every, every jot and tittle of somebody else's theology who's not you know, measuring up to yours exactly, then you are missing the point of dispensational truth and grace. Okay? Knowledge puffeth up. In, in Grace School of the Bible, 
Brother Jordan gives an illustration in one of the first classes about the, the situation over in the Middle East with the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. So a little geography lesson, right? The Sea of Galilee is in the north. The Sea of Galilee takes water in and it sends water out through the Jordan River, right? Bud, you could speak to this probably better than I could, right? And so there's life and there's vitality in the Sea of Galilee. But that water, that comes down through the Jordan River that just collects in a cesspool of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has no outlet. The water comes down and it has nowhere to what? It has nowhere to go, right? And so it just sits there and it festers. You know why they call it the Dead Sea? Because it's dead, right? There's an illustration there for our spiritual lives, folks. Do we want to be the Sea of Galilee or do we want to be the Dead Sea? Do we want to be the Sea of Galilee that takes in the Word of God and has active ministry to others and, and, and takes in and gives out and takes in and gives out and has life and vitality? Or do you want to be the, sea of, uh, the Dead Sea where you just sit there like a bump on a log and all you do is take in doctrine for the sake of correcting everybody? You following me? Philippians chapter 3. If there's, who, do you, who do you think knew more doctrine? You or Paul? Me or Paul? Pastor, whoever you want to bring up, do you think he knew more doctrine or do you think Paul knew more doctrine? Who had direct revelation of Jesus Christ saw Jesus Christ, communed with Jesus Christ, and was taught doctrine directly by Jesus Christ. Paul, if any human tells you that, you need to ask them how many pepperonis they had on their pizza. Okay, or whether or not they've been smoking peyote or something, okay? Because they don't, no human being alive today knows more doctrine, knows more truth, knows more about the Bible than the Apostle Paul did, right? Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. So here's Paul. Notice what he says. It, go, to, to get it, the context, go back to verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So did Paul have every advantage? Did he have the right birth? Was he of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, etc.? He gives his, he gives his highbrow credentials, etc.? He does that uh, just a few verses up there in verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, what? A Pharisee. Even as a Pharisee, was there anything that Paul, you could have told Paul about the law that he didn't already know? Probably not, right? Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Does Paul want to know Christ? Does he want to have a knowledge of Christ? Not just an esoteric, you know, epigenosis or genosis type knowledge where he just knows trivia about Christ. He wants a personal relationship with who? With Christ. He says, that, um, he says there in verse 8, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Is Paul mad at Christ for taking away his previous life and giving him a different ministry and setting his life on a new direction? Or is he happy about it? He's happy about it, right? That I may win Christ, verse 9, and being found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now look with me at verse 10. That, look at the first word, verse 10, that, the purpose and the intent, that I may know Him. When he says that he may know Him, he's not talking about knowing stuff about Him. That's, not, that's, that's a whole different word there in the, in the original language. The word there is not gnosis or epigenosis. The word there is gnosko, which is a whole different kind of knowledge, right? Gnosko is, is the idea, and I, I have the definition here, is the idea of to learn to know. You know, gnosko is what you do with the, your significant other when you're deciding if you want to get married or not. You get to know each other. What do you like? I like this. Well, I don't like that. Right? That's what it is. 
to, to learn to know, to come to know, to, to get a knowledge. Okay? It, it also has the idea of to become acquainted with. I mean, you meet somebody on the street, you don't know them from Adam, and you, you, you start talking to them, and when you start talking to them, what do you start to do? You start to get to what? Know them, right? That's what Paul's talking about here. He's saying that I may know him. Here's the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, the one who had had direct revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who knew more doctrine, knew more genosis, more epigenosis than any other human being about the Bible, besides the Lord Jesus Christ probably, that has ever lived, right? And here he is saying that he wants to know who. Do we? Do we want to know Christ? Hopefully. Do you understand that you have been put into a relationship with Christ? through the gospel, through the power of God and the salvation, that you and I have been put into a relationship with Christ where we can know Him? Not stuff about Him, not trivia about Him, not chapter and verse, you know, knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but to develop a relationship personally with the God of the universe. He says here that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Did Paul know all about the resurrection? Could he have told you about the resurrection backwards, forwards, sideways, in his sleep? Playing the record backwards? Okay, some of you got that joke. Okay. Did he know personally about the fellowship of his sufferings? But here he is, he's saying he wants to what? He wants to know him. He wants to attain. Paul didn't just want to know stuff about God. He wanted to know or become acquainted with Jesus Christ in the personal details of his life. And here's what I want to say about this, okay? Much of the grace movement is about knowing stuff about God with not a lot of emphasis or not a lot of thought given to actually knowing God. To actually having a relationship with God. To being able to trust God and rely on God and go to God first. Not your friends, not your spouse. You should go to your spouse, right? But to go to who first? Go to God and to come to the realization that God loves you and that God cares about you and that God wants to have a relationship with you. I'm not talking here about some, you know, nebulous sort of airy-fairy evangelical stuff. Let's have a relationship with God. No, I'm talking about you being able to know who? God. Paul didn't just want to know stuff about God. He wanted to know God. He wanted to become acquainted with God in the personal details of his own life. This is what we need now more than ever. One of the, I believe this with all my heart, that one of the reasons folks are struggling so bad right now is because they are not relying and trusting on God and they don't believe that they can. You hear what I'm saying? If you're going to come to me and talk to me from now on, I'm just going to say, if you're going to come to me and talk to me about this this thing or that thing over there or whatever, the first thing I'm going to say to you is, have you prayed about this yet and have you gone to the Word of God yet? Because I don't have anything to offer you outside or that's going to trump or be better than anything God has to say about it where? In His Word or that you're going to get by cultivating a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through your own time in prayer. I'm going to ask you, have you renewed your mind about it and have you prayed without ceasing about it? And if the answer to those things is no, because you want to call me up or call so-and-so up or go here or go there, and, and, and really, folks, hear me, be relying on substitutes. I like to think I know a lot about the Bible. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, right? But I'm not God in your life. God's God in your life. We need to trust God. And we need to pray. And we need to to prove God. Come with me to Romans 12. Come with me over to Romans 12. This is what I was trying to get at 
A few weeks back when I was talking about Psalm 1 and, 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 and that tree that's planted there by the rivers of water. Romans 12. You know why you need to rely on God? It's because God will always be there for you. He's never going to fail you. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may what? Prove what is that good and acceptable and what? Perfect will of God. See, notice what this says here. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may what? That ye may prove. When we take God at His word and we act by faith upon what God says, you know what happens? It proves itself to be true in your life. You remember 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not what? Not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every what? Thought to the obedience of who? Christ. We, that, 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 that's a high calling. This issue of proving, I want you to come back with me. I want to illustrate this for you. Go back with me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. You remember the story of David and Goliath, right? <laughs> okay, only Ernie does, so maybe we need to have a different message this morning. But you remember that the Israelites are up against the Philistines, right? And Goliath comes out every day, and he defies the armies of the living God, right? And he mocks them, and he taunts them. And, you know, by the way, it wasn't uncommon in the ancient world for military conflicts to be settled by our champion or best fighter fighting your champion and best fighter, and whoever wins that, well, we just call that good and they just win or lose, depending on the outcome of that battle, right? So Goliath is going out there and he's taunting the armies of the living God, right? Come with me, we're going to break into that story here. 1 Samuel chapter 17, look with me at verse 31. <clears throat> verse 31. And when the words were heard, which David, so David, David, he comes and remember he's bringing the bread and the, the food and such to his brothers. Verse 31, and when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his what? So, judging by the outward appearance, what's the problem with David? He's too little. He's not what? He's not experienced. He's not mature. He's not a man of war. He's a shepherd. Okay? Kind of reminds me of something Paul says about let no man despise thy what? Youth. But anyway, that's a different topic. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant, referring to himself, kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and, and smote him, and slew him. David's no sissy boy. Okay. Verse, 20, verse 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this, now watch what he says. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. Where is David getting his strength from? His estimation of his outward circumstances? No, the outward circumstances say that he's too young, not tested, immature, and is going to have his clock cleaned by Goliath, right? 
But David's confidence is not in his external situation. David's confidence is in who? God. Verse 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Now this is a fascinating thing for a lot of reasons, right? Here's the king of Israel who doesn't have this much faith. And he's going to let this 12-year-old kid or however old David is at this point, not, not yet a man, he's going to let him go what? Go do it. Now here's what I want, verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. So whose armor does Saul give to David? His own, right? So Saul doesn't get it, does he? Saul thinks that this immature kid who's barely old, big enough to probably wear this stuff is going to put on the king's armor and he's going to walk out there and he's going to best Goliath on that basis, right? Verse 39, And David girded his sword upon his armor and essayed to go. Now watch what he says. For he had not what? What does that mean? David is not going to rely on things that he hadn't proved. That he hadn't what? Tested. That he didn't have confidence in, right? Think about Romans 12 too. Be not, conf uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may what? Prove. David is proving. David hasn't proved the king's armor, so he's not going to wear it. Verse 39, And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him, and he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Right? What is my point? My point is, folks, are we relying on God, or are we relying on someone else's substitute? Are we proving God? Are we seeking after God? Are we fostering a relationship with God? Or are we relying on other people to try to do for us what only God can what? Do for us. And so when the battle comes, when the testing comes, when your Goliaths, whoever, whatever they might be, they come out, you're not relying on what you've proven God to be in your life. You're relying on what somebody else is what? Are you following what I'm saying? Come with me to Ephesians 4. I'm just going to tell you that this, this whole situation that we're dealing with, this present distress, is testing each and every one of us on what we really believe. On where we really, what we really trust in and how we choose to handle it, and how we choose to function, and operate, and relate. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, how? In love. Come over to chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse... Chapter verse 1, be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given himself for us an, an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet smelling savor, but all fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be, a, what, let it not be once named among you. Now look at the end of that, as becometh what? Do you understand that as a saint, there's a becoming way for you and I to act and walk and function? What does becoming mean? We talked about this in the past. Becoming, becoming means fitting, suitable, and what? And proper. <clears throat> Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. 
Excuse me. Verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are what? Unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Now, verse 15. See that ye render, see that none render evil for what? Evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is what? Good. Both among yourselves and to who? All men. Does that mean that I have to treat and approach somebody with whom I don't agree in meekness as becometh a saint? Yes. Because my job and my goal is not to win the argument. My job and my goal is for them to know Him. For them to know Christ. So let's go all the way back to where we started this, and that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Maybe I should have titled this the present distress and the bottom lines. Because we got, I guess we got more than one issue here, don't we? Second, Second Corinthians chapter five. Everything I just said is in relationship to verse fifteen, and that he died, he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live how unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and what rose again. So what we're seeing here is there's a there's a life that is becoming of the doctrine, becoming of the truth that saved us. And the life that's becoming of that looks at men first and foremost as people who are lost and need a what? Need a Savior. Not as this kind of person or that kind of person or this belief or that belief or that thing over there, but it's a mindset that Christ had that He exercised toward you and I. I'll tell you one thing right now. I am so glad that when I got saved, the Lord Jesus Christ did not require me to stop doing all of the dumb things I was doing before He saved me. But when we get, when we get saved and we get into doctrine, we start looking at people as somehow they're, that we're somehow better than them. Wow, wow, that... <laughs> Look at what that person's doing. I told you the joke before about the old lady in a church service who was amen in everything the preacher said until he started talking about dip and snuff. You know, chewing, chewing a little tobacco. Preacher says to the lady after the little old lady after the service, he says, Sister, you were with me. What happened? She says, Well. You got the plowing in my tater patch. But that's the way we are, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You go after that guy. Look at what that guy's doing. Look at all that stuff over there. Meanwhile, what about who? What about me? What about, what about myself? We should live not unto ourselves, but unto him which died and won. Rose again. Say one more thing, and I'm going to have to quit. Look at verse verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth. So, those are two loaded words. Wherefore, henceforth. Wherefore, on the basis of what I just said, henceforth or from now on. Right? Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. Your relationship, my relationship, our relationship with Christ is not based after the flesh, it's based after what? The Spirit, right? Knowing Christ. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man Beware, in Christ, He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? Listen to me. 
If you want to change our society, if you want to change our culture, you need to go after the heart of a man through the gospel. And you need to get the Holy Spirit in that man's heart. And that man, that woman, that child, they need to become a new creature. And they need to have a new thinking capacity. They need to have a new motivational capacity. They need to have an ability to think and, and function and so forth, not out of a dead man's old, unrenewed mind, but out of a heart that's been regenerated and made new because who lives now in that man's heart? Christ. So if we want our society, if we want our culture to change, if we want people to treat people better and behave nicer and function better and all those sorts of things, you're never going to legislate that. You're never going to rule that and dictate that from on high and say, well, if everybody would just do A, B, and C, then everything would be great. No, it wouldn't. Because the core problem of the heart has been left what? Unchanged. Come with me over to Romans 5. I still have like three... I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll, I'll stop after this point, but I might have to do another lesson on this. Romans chapter 5. Go over to Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 5. If we want society, if we want our society and our culture to change, we need to get God the Holy Spirit into the hearts of men through the preaching of the Gospel. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed... Because the love of God is shed abroad, where? In our hearts, by who? The Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Do you understand that if you're a believer today, the reason you're not lost anymore, the reason you're not dead in trespasses and sins, is because God Almighty has put His Spirit in your heart. And you can listen to a message like this, and you can respond out of a flesh mindset, out of an old man thinking pattern that's been ingrained in you, or you can respond out of faith in God's Word because you have God the Holy Spirit where? Living inside you. That's the only hope that we have save the return of Christ. And do you understand? Do you understand that even when Christ reigns, even when the Lord Jesus Christ reigns on His throne in Zion in a millennial kingdom for a thousand years, there's still going to be a bunch of knotheads at the end of that that rebel against Him? Go read Revelation 19, 20, and 21. Why? Because of the heart of an unsaved man. If we want, and by the way, that means then that we as believers, we have an obligation to live as becometh the gospel of Christ. Galatians chapter 4. <laughs> Galatians chapter 4. Verse 6. Verse 5 he says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are what? Sons. God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son where? Into your hearts crying what? Abba, Father. The only way that our society and culture can change for the better, the way we want it to change, is by putting by getting God the Holy Spirit into the hearts of men. How do you get God the Holy Spirit into the hearts of men? You preach the Word. And when you preach the Word, what do you preach? Do you preach the Gospel of the Kingdom? Do you preach Israel's program? Or do you preach the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God unto salvation? And as you teach men the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God unto salvation, and you get the Holy Spirit into their heart when they believe that Gospel, now do they have the capacity to henceforth not live unto themselves? That's the problem, isn't it? I mean, isn't that our core problem? Isn't that the core problem? If you want to change a nation, a society, and a culture, you need to focus. You need to not, you need to focus on the Gospel. You need to focus on your ambassadorship. 
Not on changing the structures, not on reseizing the political things, not on all that stuff. Now that stuff, it, it, it's important, I'm not saying it's not, but it's not the main thing. The main thing in the bottom line is this, the preaching of what? The Word of God. And it's only when this is preached and when this is believed that the power of God unto salvation is released into a man's life and God the Holy Spirit takes up a residency in that man's life and that man now has the ability to do what he could not do before and that's henceforth not live unto his what? Self. Because every, say, or every unsaved person out there, they are all they know how to do is live for who? Themselves. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is preach the Word. The bottom line is the Gospel. The bottom line is you and I developing and cultivating a relationship with the God of the universe and proving God in our lives and trusting and relying on Him and doing our job as ambassadors for Christ and sharing the Gospel so that the, and that's the only real hope that we have of turning this thing around. Otherwise, that tire is going to crash in catastrophe at the bottom of that hill. And guess what, though? I don't have time to get into it. Do we have a blessed hope? Do we have, do we have a blessed hope, and do we, are we promised through Christ salvation from the wrath to come? Okay, so really, are we in a pretty good spot? We're in a really good spot. We're in, we're in the best spot possible. So let's not be down in the dumps and kicking the dirt and woe is me. Let's be waiting and looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior who? the Lord Jesus Christ, and let's be about doing what we should be about, and let's make the bottom line the bottom line and not something else. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for these uh, saints that have patiently sat and listened to your word being preached. Lord, we need, we sing the song, Lord, I need you, every hour I need you. Paul says that I may know him. We need to Prove God in our lives. Not prove Him in the sense that, you know, whether He exists or not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about proving Him if, uh, on the basis of a renewed mind that God is for us, not against us. Paul says, if God be for us, who could be what? Against us. And it's the enemy, it is the adversary who wants to deceive you, deceive us, to snatch our joy, to take away our happiness, to get us focused on everything else and how unfair everything is. Instead of just rejoicing in who we've been made in Christ and being comfortable, or be, I'm sorry, being satisfied with living a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Help us to think and, and, and trust and rely and believe that what you say is the issue really is the issue. We're grateful for all that you've done for us through Christ. Amen.